I was wondering if there's any truth to the story about you trying to run over Terry Landell with your car back in the day. Yes, this is a crime that I will admit to because I've already gone to court and you can't. It's double jeopardy. I was trying to kill the motherfucker. Um, <laughs> uh, long Sorry. story. Long story. Well, it was. It's funny in retrospect, but and I usually don't mention his name because I go on the theory that you know it just once again it feeds the trolls. But this fucking I call. I, let's call him Ernest T. Bass because that's that's what I'm going to call him in my book that I'm going to write on Smoky Mountain Wrestling. Ernest T. Bass was an outlaw promoter. He was literally. If anybody knows who Ernest T. Bass is, if you don't look up the Andy Griffith Show, Howard Morris played this backwoods hillbilly fucking character that ju- that that threw rocks at people's windows to try to get a rise out of them, and and was always getting you know into trouble. And he was a goof and a moron, and he thought that he owned wrestling in East Tennessee. And when we started a legitimate company, he would do everything he could down to going to the Knoxville Civic Coliseum at night and pulling down off the marquee, pulling our Smoky Mountain Wrestling 8 p.m. Friday sign down off the thing. And he would do drive-bys with a megaphone when our guys were doing appearances at sponsors, car lots and things. And he just a pest. And and finally, it came to the point where I, in Knoxville, in Smoky Mountain Wrestling, right before we closed down, I didn't know we were closing at the time, but I knew I was going to prison because I actually, I, I found out that somebody that was helping carry our ring uh, was also on his ring crew, and he had done something to piss me off. So I told the guy, I said, come here a second. And I had my car sitting there at the back of the Coliseum, and I threw 10 football kicks the side of my fucking car and just caved the entire side of the door in. I said, you see that right there? That's my fucking car, and I don't give a shit about it. That means I don't give less of a shit about Terry Landell. And I pulled my gun out of the car, because back in those days, if you were a heel, you needed one. And I said, you tell that motherfucker, next time he fucks with my business, I'm going to shoot him in the fucking head. I'm going to kill him. So then through Buddy Landell, who was no relation because Terry Landell was a Buddy Landell mark, so he took his name and ruined Buddy's name in East Tennessee for years, came, well, we got to have a sit down. We got to have a powwow. We got to get together. And Terry Landell made up with me. And I knew I was going to go to prison for killing him. So I agreed to, to, okay, then we'll let your guy do a little invasion angle in Knoxville on Christmas or whatever and blah, blah, blah. And the hostilities are over with. Well, of course, I didn't know at the time I made that deal because it was about six or eight weeks before Christmas, but we closed down that year and we didn't get to the Christmas show. So as soon as we've closed down, immediately Terry Landell starts running his mouth again. I, I, I'm sorry, Ernest T. Bass. We ran Jim Cornette out of Knoxville and blah, 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 Tennessee Mountain Wrestling and blah, blah. He called it Tennessee Mountain Wrestling. It was real original. And uh, so anyway, uh, I moved on to Connecticut and didn't come back to Knoxville for like five years. And when I did come back, it was to work for Ron Fuller, who was running a summer series of events out at Chilhowee Park. (laughs) And what's the first thing I see when I get to Ron Fuller's show? But there's there's Ernest T. Bass with one of his goof wrestlers with a mask on on the roof of the building next to to Chilhowee Park throwing down free tickets to his outlaw show and dollar bills to the fans as they came into Ron Fuller's show. And so, of course, I went out there to try to find the ladder where he'd got up on the roof so that I could climb up there, and one of us was going to get thrown off that roof. But they pulled the ladder up uh, behind him, and I couldn't get up there. And and he he had the cops, and everybody was supposedly scared of him because he was related to the cops, had the cops in his pocket, whatever the fuck. Anyway... Couldn't get up there, so we had a nice little yelling match. So people don't know this about me, but in summer camp when I was a kid, I was deadly with a bow and arrow, and I'm pretty good with a slingshot. I am a pretty good marksman with a bow and arrow, slingshot, things like that. So I got me a slingshot, and I said, if I go back to Ron Fuller's show and Ernest T. Bass is up on that roof, I'm going to ding him with one of these BBs out of his slingshot right between his fat little fucking eyes. Well, come to find out he had learned a lesson. He wasn't up on the goddamn roof. He was over down the street doing a free show in a muffler shop parking lot. Oh, and I must mention that he had also somehow gotten my home number and called me and left me a message on my voicemail calling me names. But not only that, calling Stacy, my wife, who was then my girlfriend, a bunch of names that I didn't appreciate. And I wanted to speak to Mr. Bass in person one way or the other. So since he wasn't on the roof... And I couldn't get him with that slingshot. Somebody told me, but he's down there at the muffler shop parking lot putting on a free show trying to take business away from us. So I drove down there. 
actually Stace drove and I was in the passenger side and I was going to go up to Mr. Landell or Mr. Bass, whatever we're calling him these days. And I was going to ask him, okay, you talk big on my answering machine and I ain't that tough a guy, but you're a big fat fucking pussy. And you know, can you say the same things to my face when I'm standing in front of you that you want to say to my answering machine? If not, then lose my number motherfucker. Cause you're pissing me off. Well, as I see him, he's wearing a yellow jumpsuit. Uh, he looked like a giant duck. He, he's wearing a yellow jumpsuit, and he's pacing up and down the sidewalk in front of his, his place, and he's got an armed, actually off-duty police officer that he's paying his security standing next to him. So, of course, I'm not going to instigate a fight in front of a cop, but I am going to cuss him out. So we pulled up to the sidewalk, and I rolled the window down, and I said, hey, you chicken shit little bastard. Apparently, somebody, had, one of his stooges had probably told him to be on the lookout for me because he already had a can of mace in his hand. And as soon as I rolled down the window while I'm sitting in my car on the, the street, actually, it's one of the busiest streets in Knoxville. What's the name of it? God almighty, I've forgotten now. One of the busiest streets in Knoxville. I roll the window down. I'm sitting in the car. I said, hey, you chicken shit bastard. And I'm fixing to tell him off. And he reaches in and sprays me in the face with the mace. So when he did that, the idiot didn't realize I'm wearing glasses. So he only got me in one eye. So, okay, now you drew first blood shits on. So I pull my baseball bat out of the back seat and get out of the car. And I'm going to pound him into dust with the baseball bat. But one of his ring guys and one of his other stooges, one of them grabs me from behind around my arms and the other one is trying to get the bat away from me. But the guy that grabbed me from behind grabbed my upper arm instead of my lower arm, so I still have freedom of motion in my elbow. So I'm over the back of my shoulder hitting this guy in the head with the baseball bat. <laughs> and because I'm swinging it forward before I swing it back, the guy in front of me cannot get the baseball bat away either. Meanwhile, the armed police officer off duty that he's paying to be there as his security is screaming into his little police microphone 911 911 and Terry Landell is running away so as i get i get free now meanwhile stacy sees that i am being accosted by more than one individual so having more guts than any of them she comes around and she starts to get into it too and she grabs a folding chair <laughs> as she grabs the folding chair, since I'm tied up with these two guys, but they're apparently doing me no damage, she's going after Ernest T. Bass with the folding chair. And you have never lived, you have never lived, Dallas, until you have seen a five foot six, 250 pound fat tub of shit dressed in a yellow jumpsuit running like a little bitch down the sidewalk of one of the busiest streets in Knoxville being chased by a woman swinging a metal folding chair at him while spraying the mace over his shoulder and yelling, help me, help me, help me. So I get free of the guys that can't get the bat away from me. And then I saw that since I can't see very well, I said, we better leave. So I tell her, jump in a car. So I jump in the driver's seat and Stacy jumps in the passenger seat where the window is still down. And as I start to take off, I realize the car sitting there has died. So as I start the car again, Ernest T. Bass runs up and reaches in and sprays her six inches from her eyes with the mace right in the face because he's a pussy and a coward and he deserves to die. And that's, that's what I intended to do. So seeing that, I get the car started and instead of putting it in drive to pull off, I put it in reverse and back up and I hop that fucking curb and the only thing I can see out of my one good eye is that yellow jumpsuit and I floor it and I'm going to run this motherfucker down. Flat the fuck down. Had every intention of killing him right there in front of everybody. But... He ran in between the cars, so I couldn't get to him. And right at that point that he ran in between the cars, <laughs> on the side that my bad eye was, I noticed, and I actually heard more than noticed, <laughs> another motherfucker just rolled up over my hood because as he had run between the cars, he had taken his sound guy and jerked him in the way, and I run over the sound guy. He comes up over the hood, and I hit the brakes, and he fucking runs back off, and then I go, well, shit, we better go now. Cause I can't get my target anyway. So we pulled out and we took off and we went back to chill park and got our shit. And we drove back on, we got on the interstate and came back to Kentucky where we stopped. And after we washed our face out, cause I knew the cops were coming, had a good meal at a, at a Ruby Tuesday and went on home. And 
Funny thing about it, I hope this ain't taking too long. No, not but at all. <laughs> the funny thing about it is within literally a week and a half, I'm going into an OVW event and I get to meet with, they had called the cops and said I did everything. I mean, I'm talking about attempted murder and attempted manslaughter and assault with a deadly weapon. And, and they said I actually pulled out on one of the busy, and this was about a Friday, about five o'clock. So I supposedly pulled out on one of the busiest streets in Knoxville while blind and did donuts two or three times around and then pulled off. And they, this whole big story, to make it even sound even worse than what it was. Of course, they did nothing wrong. So they had all kinds of warrants out for my arrest, but within 10 days, I was met going into an OVW show by a process server to serve me with a civil suit by the guy that I ran over. <laughs> but yet they couldn't come get me. It wasn't three. It was three months before I went to Knoxville and turned myself in on this because I called and made arrangements with the attorney and I'm going to go get this thing settled. And so I go in and, and of course the, you know, the attorney walks me in and, and a bunch of the police had worked for me in Knoxville and knew the guy. They knew uh, everybody in town. He's like the, the local goof. Everybody knows the local town drunk and the local goof. And so as they're actually fingerprinting me, one of the cops says, I heard you tried to kill Terry Landell. And, of course, what am I going to say? I said, well, that's what they claim. He said, well, too bad you missed. So that was the cop's opinion of him. So anyway, then I made it known through my attorney that uh, we had already found out that besides the fact that uh, that he had instigated the thing by macing me in the face and that I was blind at the time and defending myself, that the guy that I had run over that he had put in the way of me had gone to a, that was suing me, had gone to a few different uh, doctors trying to get surgery because he was known as a pill shopper. And he was using this, this and he wasn't injured by the, the, the car incident, but he was using that to try to get pills. And the whole bunch of them was a bunch of goddamn East Tennessee hillbilly fucking idiots. And so basically I pleaded guilty to reckless driving and went on my merry way because I was going to take him down and the pill shopper down and everybody else down in court since I couldn't get them any other way. But yes, the story can now be told because the statute of limitations has run out and I've already pleaded guilty to reckless driving. I was going to kill that mother bigger than sh motherfucker bigger than shit. And the reason why that I have not been back to the city of Knoxville, Tennessee to this day is is because if I ever do see him and he will make sure he's seen, I've, I've, I've told everybody I can think of to tell him every if first time I see you, I'll kill you. That's why I don't go back. He can have Knoxville. I'll take the rest of the country. He's got what he wants, but a lot of people would like to see him floating down the Tennessee river. I was just the only one that ever had the balls to do anything about it. Cause believe me, he, he's done a lot worse shit to other people than he did to me. And for some reason he's still alive. I don't know why. 